was ready. And yes, was I a suffragette. 55 years, never stopped. Started with early franchise clubs. After that, I went to the 19th Amendment. Then I followed up with the Equal Rights Amendment. And then I started lobbying textbook companies. Where is the information about women? But I don't want to get ahead of myself. I want to tell you a little bit about my wonderful family. I was born into one of the founding families of Fairfield. My grandmother in her early 80s, Charlotte, was the minister of an Episcopal church when her husband was unable to preach. How many women can say something about that? Well, my father was absolutely amazing. My father was a Civil War hero. He graduated from Yale University. He was in the Congress for 20 years, both in Connecticut and in Washington, D.C. Also, after that, 37 years, various jobs, companies in the Norwalk area. He was particularly involved with such things as the railroads. He was able to travel transcontinental to Russia to meet with delegates. He was with the National Bank of Norwalk. The best thing about my father, oh, this was so important. He believed men and women were equal. Now, my mother, Mary, Mary was a suffragette, never missed a meeting, was a great leader, and took myself and two sisters to the suffragette meetings. She also started the Daughters of the American Revolution here in Connecticut. Oh, I had two older sisters. They were strong suffragettes as well. There was Claire and there was Helena. Now you've heard, you know, little women, they put on plays in the attic, they put in plays in the living room. Well, the Hill sisters, they put on plays in little theaters all up and down the Connecticut coastline. And what was the theme of their plays? Women's rights. They took plays, they adapted them. You know, we even wrote our own plays. Well, when it came time for us to go to college, we had to go to a strong woman's college. We went to Vassar. Oh, we loved Vassar and Vassar loved us. Well, while I was there, I started the Equal Franchise Clubs, which were organizations to support the 19th Amendment. I was so successful with my own group of people at Vassar, I couldn't believe it. I was asked all over the United States to start similar early franchisement clubs for women. And we had men as well. Well, what I was most proud of, I was even asked down south to the black colleges to start these clubs there as well. Well, when each of his sisters graduated from Vassar, we got $1,000, which was a lot of money at that time. My father wanted us to travel abroad to learn languages, to learn about different cultures. And I did that for two years. Then I came back and I decided to settle in Washington, DC. I wanted to do something with the government. I wasn't certain exactly what, and I needed a job. 
So I taught French in one of the high schools in Washington, D.C. My timing was perfect. At the same time I got there in my early 20s, Alice Paul, the great suffragette leader of the third wave, was coming back from England and she had just worked with the Pankers. Oh, she was so full of wonderful ideas. She had started the National Women's Party. Oh, I was right there working with Alice. I so admired this woman. She was just about the same age I was and she was very taken by me with what I had done with these clubs all over the country. Well, our very first task, we were gonna have the Women's March on Washington in front of the White House right before the inauguration of Woodrow Wilson. We were gonna show everyone that we needed the right to vote. Well, Alice, put a lot on my plate there. She said, you know, you're organized, you can speak, you can write. I want you to take care of the permits, the paperwork. I want you to go to those colleges and clubs. I want you to find funding for them. I want you to get the women there to march. I want you to get crowd control and I want you to have the speakers, you know the kind of speakers we need at the end of the parade. Well, the parade did not go, the march did not go exactly as we had expected. At the end, 200 people on both sides were arrested. But did we consider it successful? Yes, we did why we had put ourselves on the map. We had shown our voice and our power and people knew there was no way that we were going away. So what are we gonna do next? We have to keep this momentum going. So we decided the National Women's Power that we were going to chain ourselves to the fence of the White House. There were a group of about 100 of us that rotated. We were gonna petition, we were gonna protest, we were gonna hand out brochures. We were gonna get thrown in prison, we knew that. But we were strong, we were dedicated, we were giving our all. Going to prison was brutal. I was in prison for longer periods of time than just about anyone else. Why was that? I didn't just protest in front of the White House. I protested in Denver and Boston and New York and all over the United States. Well, the protest that I am most known for was in Washington, Lafayette Square. I climbed up on the statue of Lafayette and I leaned out to the side to give my speech. And I said, you know, men think women want to be on a pedestal. Well, you know, some women do not want to be on a pedestal. Some women would like the right to vote so that they could have their own voice. Well, you can imagine how long I was thrown into prison for that particular one. 1920 came along and we finally got the right to vote. Oh, they almost had to give it to us. We had 15 groups of women allied working in the war effort. We had nurses, ambulance drivers, translator, telephone operators, sacrificing, dedicating their lives to the war. How could they keep us from voting? Finally, 100 years ago, we got the right to vote. 
Were Alice and I finished? Absolutely, positively not. We did not just want the right to vote. We wanted equal rights. We didn't want to have all these little amendments. We wanted equal pay, equal job opportunities, equal health, equal security. And boy, did we have to fight for it. It was so political, it was so different, and we still don't even have it today. Well, in 1923, Alice, myself, and my husband, Albert Levitt, who was a lawyer, got together and penned the Alice Paul Amendment for equal rights. We gave it to the Congress. The Congress said you have till 1972 to get this ratified. I was so proud. Connecticut was the fifth state to ratify and it never rescinded. Well, we never got the votes. We were always only three or four short. But we kept working and people are still working today. Why did we not get the vote? Oh, it was so political. It still is. There were so many factions against us. Well, there was Phyllis Shafley, good old Phyllis, who was like, oh, I'm Susie Homemaker. Well, she absolutely was not. She was a very shrewd lawyer. Oh, you don't want the ERA. Women are all going to go to war, get shot on the front lines. And who's going to take care of the kids? And those benefits you get because of your husband, poof, they're going to all be gone. And we're all going to be in the same bathroom together. Oh, she was so to the extreme. And then there were the aunties. These were the Southern women. Oh, we want our husband to make the decisions. We don't need to vote or to have any rights. My husband will decide. Of course, those who were against prohibition didn't like us. The Catholics didn't like us. Certain Republicans didn't like us. Democrats didn't like us in certain areas. Oh, there were so many people against us. But we just kept going. We never gave up through the whole 1920s. Well, in 1930, Alice started working with NATO and she started working with the UN and in various citizenship arenas. And she said to me, you know, Elsie, I need to turn over the party while I am away to somebody else. You know more about equal rights than anyone else. I want you to take it over and to be the spokesperson. I was like, oh, this is a huge responsibility. But yes, I did it. I started by whistle stop on a train and I went across the country. I stopped at 40 cities. I would get in back of the train and I would talk about the ERA. I did the same going across New York and in the Midwest. If anyone needed a speaker on women's rights, I was there. I also ran the conferences and the conventions and the symposiums. I went before legislative bodies. I went into the colleges and universities. I wrote all of the articles and additional legislation. I even ran three times for Congress, thinking that will help. That will get me networking. That will get me affiliations. That didn't work either. Well, it also cost me my marriage. My husband had a judgeship in the Virgin Islands. He wanted desperately to do this. I, I could not go. I had worked so long and so hard, I could not leave the ERA. Now, no one knew 
that we had divorced. Why? I never took his last name. <gasps> when people heard that a woman in my day did not take their husband's last name, this was blasphemous. But people didn't realize, yes, we had divorced. 1940 comes along. Alice is living in Vermont. It's not very good for commuting abroad and to Washington and to New York. So she came to live with her sister, Branchville, 102, on the border there in Ridgefield. Her sister had a house with a pond and some cabins in the back. And interestingly enough, we were now three quarters of a mile from each other. We could walk to each other house. I was living in my beautiful rock house on 70 Acres Lane in Reading, which was right on the border of Branchfield. Oh, this was certainly not a beautiful house. It was a field stone farmhouse. Oh, but I loved this house. And my daughter took it over and then her grandson and now two wonderful women are living there and it's almost like a museum and a memorial to me. Well, anyway, Alice came back and quite shortly after that, her sister passed and Alice said, well, I guess I'm gonna sell this and I'm gonna use the money for ERA. I said, oh no, 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 Alice. We are going to start a leadership camp for young women there. Remember us in our 20s, determined, passionate, dedicated, focused. That's what we need. And we started this leadership camp for women. And oh, it worked so well. Still fighting for the ERA. Well, there were four things that I did without Alice, that I thought were very important. And I want you to hear about these. Well, first of all, I decided to do some research. I got all these textbooks. Where is the information on women? There was Pocahontas, there was Sacagawea, there was Eleanor Roosevelt, there was Harriet Tubman, uh, there was Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and there was Susan B. Anthony. That's about all that any of the textbooks ever mentioned. We were 50% of the population, and that's all there was. Well, I was really successful in getting many of the textbooks company to give us a little more time and space. I then went to the colleges and the high schools, the curriculum directors, and I said, where, where are your women's studies courses? We're not in the textbooks. We need courses to fill in the gaps. And sure enough, I do not think that there is a college or university anywhere today that does not have women's studies courses. Most of the colleges have women's studies majors and they're very, very popular. The other thing that I did directly related to Norwalk. Oh, I love the Lockwood Matthews Mansion. It was so beautiful, so powerful, such a part of my history. It was in disrepair, it needed funding. Oh, there was danger that it would be torn down. I worked endlessly on the committee with so many others to save this. And I'm so proud of that. And the last thing that I had to do related back to my father. My father took the trip to Russia on the train, the first one able to do that. Well, I was the first woman to fly Pan Am into Russia to meet with a delegation. I was so proud and so happy I could do this because now I could link 
my father's story of Russia to my own story of Russia. Well, I died before Alice. I died in Norwalk. And I also was buried in Norwalk. Um, was my life fruitful? Was it helpful? Was it good? I think so. I'm very proud of what I was able to do in my 55 years of fighting for women's rights. And we always hear the saying, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it takes huge groups of strong women to pass legislation. And of course, Alice Paul, Caddy Chapman Cat, they were the generals in the fight for women's rights. But I like to think of myself as a brigadier general because I was right in there all the time with Alice Paul.